Hi everyone, my name's Andrew J. Clark. I'm a commercial and landscape photographer from Western Australia. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the Sony Alpha 7 III for landscape photography, seriously. Okay, so let's say you do both videography and photography, and you've seen all the reviews of the S3 hailing it as a technical masterpiece when it comes to videography. And you're pretty sure it's gonna future-proof your videography for a long time with 4K, 120p, 10-bit, 422, all eye compression, 4K, 60p, raw recording to an external recorder, as well as super high frame rates at full HD, 240 frames per second, among many other awesome features. But there's that niggling question that remains, is the 12 megapixels on the S3 gonna be enough for your photography needs in 2020? Well, here's the answer for all but a select few of you. Now I'm presupposing here that videography is a really, really important part of your content creation. If videography is more of a secondary endeavor, then there's likely gonna be better options for you if you just wanna work with one camera. A few specific use cases where you're probably gonna to wanna to go with another option instead of or in addition to the S3. Things like doing large prints bigger than about A3, wildlife or action photography where heavy cropping is required, and certain kinds of commercial photography like product photography, architectural photography, fashion photography, where your clients simply demand high resolution files. Now you'll notice that I don't have landscape photography on that list. And you might be thinking to yourself, hold on Andrew, I know you shoot with the R4 and love a good chunky crop. And yes, that is true. And I'm not gonna try and convince you that the S3 is a great option for a professional landscape photographer. But I am here to tell you that the S3 can create amazing landscape images. And if all you're doing is delivering your files to social media or web delivery, or just doing small to medium sized prints, it's probably gonna be enough for you. There's also a bunch of other reasons why the camera is just kind of fun to shoot on for landscape photography. I'll run through some of those at the end. But suffice it to say, if I'm stuck in the field with just the S3, I'm gonna be confident that I can get great landscape shots on this. And also confident that I can print them up to about A3, potentially A2 size, depending on what print media you're going with and what your standards for sharpness are. How can I be so confident, I hear you ask? Well, I've already done it. This is an image captured on the S3 recently, printed at A2 size on a semi-gloss pearl paper. What's more, this image is actually cropped from this resolution to this resolution, mainly to fix the aspect ratio from the native two by three to five by seven for printing, but there's also a slight crop for content as well. Now, even after this small 10% crop, the resolution of this file is actually still greater than your standard 4K resolution once you correct for the orientation. So if you were to deliver this file digitally in 4K resolution and display it in full screen, the file is gonna be essentially indistinguishable from the file you could capture on a high resolution camera such as the 61 megapixel A7R4. That is for the 99.9% .9 of people who don't have a monitor with resolution greater than 4K. Now, how can I be confident of that, you ask? Well, I also took this image on the R4 at the exact same time. Yeah, I'll figure out a better way to display prints in a later video. How did I manage this? Well, hang around and I'll show you. So I've made it out to North Trigg Beach. This stretch of coastline is one of my favorite near Perth for seascape photography, and you can probably see why. Got some pretty good conditions coming in, some high clouds. Hopefully we'll get some color around sunset. I've come out today to test the A7S 3 versus the a7R4 for seascape photography. The goal here isn't to see which one's best, I kind of already know which one's gonna be best, but rather to see if the a7S3 can give me some really good results for landscape photography. Normally what I do when I get to my landscape shoots is to scout around and look for a composition, usually with a zoom lens on the camera and without my tripod. Today I'm actually gonna do that with the a7S3 because I think the fully articulating screen is actually gonna make it easier for me to do my scouting. Uh, so yeah, time's running out, let's get to it. So I found something that I kind of like, it's a variation on a shot which I've taken before, but sure enough, immediately, the flip out screen has come in handy because it's a low down portrait shot and I can already see that the frame's gonna work without having to bend over or graze my knees on the very jagged rocks. Particularly important because I decided to wear shorts today for some reason. All right, let's head over there and I'll try and show you my setup as we're going. All 
All right, that was a lot slower than I'd like. I'll show you how I've got myself set up. So you can see I've got both cameras set up right next to each other, as close as I could possibly get it. It's a little bit difficult with the travel tripod, it's not exactly sturdy. But I've got hider filters on the front, six stop square ND and a CPL on both of them. So we should be getting equivalent exposures. I've got the A7R4 using the uh, 24 to 70 GM and the A7S3 using the 24 prime GM. So it should be same focal length and they're both GM glass, so optical quality should be pretty good. Okay, so some quick things. I ended up ditching the six stop ND pretty quickly. Got too, way too dark too quickly. I like to get my shutter speeds around the one to two second mark. Definitely felt a bit slower on the A7S III. In particular, there was, there was one setting which I really needed to turn off, which is the long exposure noise reduction. Uh, but I didn't know in the menus where it was. It was pretty intuitive on the A7S III I found, um, but not being used to the touch screen uh, made it a little bit more difficult for me. I did find it and turn it off relatively quickly though. The other thing I'm definitely noticing with these two cameras, that flip out screen makes it so much easier to compose my shots. You can see here the setup that I'm dealing with, how much easier it is to you know, make micro adjustments on the A7S III looking straight down from my perspective. There's really no way I can get my face down into that spot to see the back of the screen on the A7R4. So I am somewhat guessing and, and I've got this distorted like parallax issue looking down on the back screen trying to compose everything and line up the horizons. Hopefully I've done an okay job, but I guess we'll see when we check out the photos back in the studio. I got the timing on that one just right. This, the photos should be synced up completely. So one of the things which can crop up with cameras like the A7S III that have much larger individual pixels and a smaller overall resolution count uh, is that when they overheat, they create hot pixels and because the pixels are larger in your frame, they're more noticeable on the image. So this crops up for landscape photographers when you're doing super long exposures uh, and the sensor heats up. Sony also has a mode on the camera called long exposure noise reduction, which is great. It operates really well to remove those hot pixels but it does double the length of your exposure because it has to take a black frame afterwards to gather the noise profile. So I'm doing a test now with the A7R4, the A7S III, I'm taking a four minute long exposure, which in my experience is usually enough to create some hot pixels. I'm gonna compare how they look on the A7S III to the A7R4. One thing you'll probably notice as a trend in this review is I'm, I'm trying to convince you that the A7S III is perfectly usable for landscape photography. This is one of those areas where I think there's gonna be a real tangible difference. I'll just jump in here to say that my hypothesis here was completely wrong and the A7S III actually performed incredibly well in this test. Even at a 500% crop, the hot pixels are barely noticeable in the image and are certainly a great improvement over the A7 III, for example. I'll be following up with some even longer exposures to test it further, but at this stage, I'm confident that the A7S III is not gonna have significant issues with hot pixels. If I have to turn on that noise reduction, every single time I take a super long exposure with the A7S III, that practically is gonna make things a lot harder for me. Also, as, although I calculated four minutes, the light's getting so much darker, I'm gonna let it run for a little bit longer as well. All right, that's about it from this shoot. I uh, got some interesting light at the end there. You can see there's actually some street lights really close to the beach here. And that was feeding in a little bit of ambient light onto the front rocks for the last super long exposures. Be interested to see how that turns out in post. Often the color balance is completely put out of whack by these really orange lights. You can see it on my face too. 
I'm also really interested to see how the a7c which I'm filming on right now has done with this low light vlog uh, situation it's telling me ISO is up to ISO 8000 I'm shooting at f1.8 on the uh, 20 millimeter G lens um, so that's it from this shoot and uh, let's have a look at the images back in the studio cheers Okay, some quick notes on the images you just saw and how I processed them. The color balance of the R4 was slightly warmer and the tint was slightly to the magenta, which I actually preferred straight out of camera, but the S3 was more true to life. I can't say for certain what the white balance on the R4 was set to because I tend not to pay attention to it when I'm shooting in RAW, but I do know that the S3 was set to auto. So all I can say is that the S3 did produce accurate results in those conditions. So I did use Photoshop to remove a rock from the bottom left hand corner of both of the images. This was because the slightly different perspective of the two cameras actually made that rock look very different between the two photos and I wanted the photos to look as close to identical as possible. On that point, although the polarizer I used was the same for both of the shots, the Hyder M10 CPL, the polarizer was clearly rotated slightly differently, which resulted in the R4 image having a richer deep blue in the top right hand corner. I didn't notice this at the time, mainly because the R4 doesn't have a fully articulating screen and I found it quite difficult to monitor. I did apply an additional radial filter to the S3 image to correct for this. Interestingly, the S3 image was also slightly darker than the R4 image by about a third of a stop. And I'm not really sure why this was the case. My best guess is that it had something to do with the polarizer position or potentially to do with the light transmission of the respective lenses. I had a look for some data on the 24 to 70 GM and the 24 prime GM, and I couldn't really find any definitive answers. So if you do know anything about light transmission for these two lenses, absolutely chuck it in the comments below because I'm very interested particularly because I would have expected the result to be the other way around, if anything, with the S3 creating a brighter image. Anyway, I applied a slight exposure bump to the S3 to get them to match. Otherwise, all colors, contrast, local adjustment, curves, sharpening was the same between the images. On the sharpening point, I've sort of fallen out of the habit of sharpening my R4 images. You can probably guess why. But I did find that applying a little bit of sharpening to the S3 image, particularly for the 4K export, made a big difference. So if you are gonna end up doing a lot of stills on the S3, you'll find a bit of sharpening will help a lot. As I said earlier, the 4K exports of these images look virtually identical. So if all you're doing is exporting for social media, which typically has resolutions much lower than 4K and applies heavy compression, you're really not gonna tell the difference. In fact, I ran an Instagram poll using two images from this shoot, and of the 250 people who responded, about 60% of people got it wrong. Now, there was certainly nothing scientific about that test, but a lot of photographers these days, from hobbyists, even certain pros, only really deliver their content digitally or through social media. And if that applies to you, you can rest assured that virtually no one on these platforms will be able to tell the difference between an image captured on the 12 megapixel S3 and the 61 megapixel R4. But what about if you are serious about printing? What kind of results can you expect from the S3? Well, I printed both of these images at both A3 and A4 size, and I'll chuck up a table with the respective pixels per inch for those print sizes. Now, this isn't a video about the technical side of printing, and I'm certainly not holding myself out as any sort of master printer. But if you know anything about the industry, you may have heard of 300 PPI being a bit of a guiding target for good resolution prints. On that basis, you can reasonably expect that the R4 is gonna produce a good quality print at either size whereas the S3 may struggle at A2 and should produce a pretty good result at A3. And that's basically what my experience was. The R4 prints look amazing at both sizes. The S3 print looks great at A3 size and you really can't tell a difference until you get you know, a few centimeters away from the prints. At A2 size, the difference in resolution is noticeable but once you step back to a more reasonable viewing distance for an A2 print, maybe a meter, a meter and a half away, that difference kind of does fall away. And it's also important to note that the print media I selected for this, a glossy fine art pearl paper, I chose specifically because it will show off resolution differences much more so than something like a canvas or even a matte paper will. So now I've got four prints of the same image, which I don't need. So I'm gonna be giving away both of the A3 sized image 
and the R4 A2 image. I'm gonna hold on to the larger S3 print, not because I don't think it's a passable print, it definitely is, but because I don't want any pixel peepers out there to be disappointed with their prize. So to enter the print giveaway, I'm gonna keep it super easy. Just subscribe to this YouTube channel and leave a comment below, which includes your Instagram handle. I'll then do the draw and contact the winners on Instagram. Unfortunately, the print giveaway is only open to people in Australia this time around, just because of the difficulties created by the COVID pandemic. As soon as international shipping prices and timelines return to normal, I'm gonna do another print giveaway for the international people. Okay, some final thoughts about the S3 for landscape photography. Once you move past image quality, it's actually a really great experience shooting on this camera anyway. In particular, the smaller file size actually makes things a lot easier from a file handling point of view. It's easier on your memory cards, on your computer storage, on your editing program, and it even gives you a huge buffer if you need it. The small file size also makes it really easy to do things like time lapses and does make your social media sharing workflow a bit easier and quicker. I mentioned it in the location footage as well but that flip out screen is such a huge quality of life improvement for landscape photographers i've been asking for it for so long and i really hope it's used on all sony alpha cameras in the future the camera's also reportedly got about 15 stops of dynamic range which is great for landscape photographers and finally, its high ISO performance should make it quite a good astrophotography camera, especially for things like astrophotography time lapses. All right, that's it from me. If you like this video, that button works. If you wanna see some more content on the S3 or you wanna enter the print giveaway, you can hit the subscribe button. Otherwise, chuck any questions in the comments below and I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers.